Hi, Michael. Hello. A few minutes early. How's it going? Good, thank you. Good. Um, I think the, um, you know, we've had uh, more uh, contributions to the document, um, which is good. Cool. I'm going to go through that. Um, there's been some really good um, discussion actually at the number of other meetings, um, some other uh, references that we can add in here too. Cool, cool. Hey, did you? Oh, hello. I found us on CNCF Slack and I uh, am I audible? Yes, you can. Yep, I can hear you. Oh, yep. sorry. I wasn't sure. Uh, I found us on the CNCF Slack. I'm a member of the Intoto team at NYU. So I just thought I'd swing by and see what's happening. Awesome. Welcome. You found the right place. <laughs> Definitely. Andres. Hey, Cole. Hey, how's it going? Good, thank you. Almost done with your day, aren't you, Jonathan? Ready for the uh, weekend? Yeah, just another six hours. We'll be good to go. Yeah. <laughs> Got anything exciting today. going on this weekend? Uh, I am actually taking President's Day off. Uh, yeah. Decided everyone else in the US is off. I'm going to take a day off too. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. How about, how about you? Um, I got, uh, I got my boat out of the water, so I'm going to, uh, give it some love. I got to put a new radio in it. The other one got water damaged and then, you know, do some polishing and stuff. Nice. Yeah. Have a couple cold beverages and, and just kind of enjoy, enjoy the downtime. I was jealous just for the fact you were going outside. We're still locked down in the UK to be fair. We can <laughs> pretty much go nowhere. So you already got us uh, going outside. Yeah, I live on, I, I have about an acre and a half, so that's no one's stopping me from going outside. And you say rest and downtime, but I'm sure as you'll be sipping that beer every other sip, supply chain security will come back. <laughs> I'm going to try not to. I'm going to try not to. It's change of senior. Yeah. Trying is the key word. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll probably be listening to podcasts to tell you the truth. So you're you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Um. So I updated the GitHub issue because it needed some PLC, at least the like summary of the issue. I pulled down most of your links from down there, Jonathan. Make sure that the calendar invite is discoverable, that we have the links to the notes. And that was on me, I think. I think no one else had edited access to it. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think we can kick off, but frankly, I think we can make it relatively free flowing, right? Um, so what I was going to do is just go back through the document, see if there's anything specifically to add or anything people wanted to bring up. Um, before that, just sort of raising to people's attention. Um, I was on a, a, an interesting call with the OSSF. Um, is that the day before yesterday or yesterday? Um, and they were discussing reproducible builds, um, which I think it'd be interesting. I mean, it'd be interesting at least to add that as references and sort of contemplate some of that, uh, certainly around maybe the higher security end of this. But they have um, a chap called um, David Wheeler, uh, who's uh, Got a lot of interesting work that he's done in the past, and um, including a PhD thesis. Um, um, and this is at a Linux Foundation overarching level, correct? Um, that was in in what context? 
uh, the OSSF? The OSSF is, I believe so, yeah. The, the, the conversation was more just general, uh, an update from um, the chap that runs reproducible builds org. Um, it was a really interesting conversation. Uh, I think they've got a, uh, a video available recording the conversation. I might want to go and check it out, but also reproduciblebuilds.org, I think. Yeah, I know Intoto has done some work there with some of the uh, uh, rebuilders and, and the testers on that. Uh, you know, they showed something yesterday on their community call that was pretty interesting. I can find the reference. And so, uh, I saw them down there. Maybe a ditch you can talk to that. Oh, uh, yeah, actually, yeah. I was presenting the rebuilder re work on the yeah. community meeting yesterday. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, oh, so, okay. yeah. Uh, so, yes, we are working with the reproducible builds community. We are uh, working on using internal attestations for. Uh, the results of rebuilders, and uh, I administer an Arch Linux rebuilder at NYU. Uh, and, I, and I think the URL was reproducible-builds.org. I can, I can drop that in the chat for others who are interested in the project. Yep. Uh, I'll just added it to the references too. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Um, the reason for bringing that up is, is we, we haven't, I don't believe we've necessarily discussed that as part of our conversation so far. And I just wanted to see if there's um, interest and support for, for adding that in terms of best practice, potentially for some of the higher security. Uh, you know, we had the two personas, the low and high. Yeah, I think, you know, when you get down to it, when you threat model everything out, you know, that's really, you know, the only way you can really make some reasonable assumptions about the security of your software is if you rebuild it on n number of nodes and those hashes match, right? You know that the attacker would have to attack n number of nodes for, for that to fail, for that to be compromised. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and on, on my end, this is uh, from a few years ago, but... Um, even even uh, not necessarily fully reproducible builds, but like mostly reproducible builds has uh, helped us out a lot in the past in just like being able to get some reasonable guarantees. You know, and I'm wondering, you know, like those, those rebuilders, uh, I've been doing a lot of research into DBOM the past couple of days. Uh, and they have this concept of like a DBOM node. I'm wondering if, yeah. if you know, if you had a rebuilder and had that as a public DBOM node, and then you could almost have it as a, like a community effort. You could open source some of the security for, for our open source software to make sure that the builds are actually happening the way we, we want them to. So the DBOM node would also rebuild the software and publish the attestations via the DBOM channel? Well, the yeah, well, wherever, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be the DBOM node software that rebuilds it, right? It'd be something like the Intoto Rebuilder that, that they've been working on, right? And then it publishes that to the DBOM node, right? Which distributes that, you know, via the, the public channel. So it'd publish an SBOM, it would, yeah, okay. How far along is that Intoto Rebuilder? Do you know? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm a little confused by that question. Uh, do do you do you mean a specific instance of a rebuilder, or do you do you mean the various ways of tying into the attestations into rebuilders, or? So Cole said the rebuilder is being worked on. Right. To, like, uh, by that, is it something readily available if we're documenting best practices? tell people, hey, here's a complete solution. You can reference if you're looking for reproducible builds. 
or if it's something that eventually will become available. I don't track the project too closely. So. Right. Uh, so we're working closely with the Debian side of reproducible builds for the, uh, and, and we also have an app transport for, to perform the verification. Uh, and we're also working with, uh, with the Arch Linux based rebuilders, which uses a project called Rebuilderdy. And I think in the last couple of weeks or so, there's been some interest from a core member of the Cubes project, and they've been working on using in total attestations within, I think they call it RPM reproduce and so on. There were there was some mention of this on the community call yesterday as well, and I can track down those resources so, so that I can kind of give you a picture of uh, where the Intoto team is trying to plug into existing rebuilder infrastructure. Gotcha. So there's there's a few references that say for people are to productionize it, they can look up at. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to track those links on now. Yeah. Jonathan, it feels that reproducible builds should be included, given particularly we have Aditya and, and Mike to contribute. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. So I've added it, the reference. We might as well put that in there in the middle. I, I might. might tentative question in there is, is um, I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty mature on Debian. I mean, they've, they've done some awesome work there as well. I'm just wondering how prevalent that is through the rest of the industry. I mean, some of the stuff that we're talking about is, is perhaps, you know, we've discussed this before, right, Cole, and that look, this is best practices now. And then this is here, we're trying to fill the gaps and some of the future work around some of the DBOM work that you and I are talking about and some of the Spiffy and Toto work. Yeah. We, I think we should definitely reference it and put it in here, right? I'm just wondering about how mature that is. If we give them someone best practice advice, but we're still building out some of the infrastructure around it, maybe that's an identified gap, but, uh, or, or rather something that's to be thought through, not necessarily something that's um, you know, widely adopted as yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I think reproducible build as a concept is different than the actual implementation, right? You know, the implementation is fairly new. And, and I think, you know, they're working through some of the issues and, and some of the design of that, um, you know, look to be working really well. I, I have to take a deeper look at some of the source code that they've been, they've been doing, but I think we can list it maybe as like, hey, this, this, is, this is some of the current work going on, but hey, you should strive to achieve reproducible builds and actually test those reproducible builds in your environment, whether that just be, you know, another Jenkins job on a different set of infrastructures for their, for high security workloads. Hi, this is Cameron. Sense. I'm sorry I joined late and kind of, kind of late to the party. <laughs> it's good to meet you all. Welcome Sounds you. like you're talking about the CI model, so to speak, <laughs> and all of its forms. Well, it, it's it's really the whole supply chain, right? Right down from the uh, ingestion and, and security of the dependencies and yeah. your uh, source code, right through into how you're building that product, um, through to how you're distributing it, and um, sending out evidence of what's in that build, uh, and effectively S bombs and such. So it's, it's kind of really looking at it from an end-to-end -end perspective. But what we're also looking at is you know, what is the best practice of, of producing those builds? And that's how we've sort of led to, to the reproducible builds con concept and some great conversation that was on the OSSF a couple of days ago and um, from the Debian team. So I, I come from the, uh, the SUSE and open SUSE world. Um, I, I'm an employee of SUSE. Um, so I can give you some insight on what uh, what's going on in that open source community as well from a supply chain perspective. Um, and also Rancher, uh, since Sousa owns Rancher now as well. Um, so we've got a convergence of supply chain coming in here. <laughs> um, and uh, two different companies doing it two different ways. Um, and uh, there's, going to, there's going to be some big changes coming soon. Uh, in the open SUSE community, you will see a convergence of Rancher Labs and open SUSE coming together to create actually some brand new supply chain methodologies. Um, 
So it'll be very interesting to see what happens with that. Our current process uses a tool called the Open Build Service. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. Um, it's actually used by the Linux Foundation to build all of their Linux distribution stuff. It is a complete supply chain tool. It builds RPMs and builds entire Linux distributions. Um, you can use it to build Ubuntu, Red Hat, CentOS, and many other flavors of Linux. But SUSE uses that. It's, it's, our, it's our bread and butter. It's what builds SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. It's what builds OpenSUSE Tumbleweed and Leap. Um, there's a lot of security built into that supply chain. It's very interesting from an authorization standpoint when you see people building out, um, you know, their own supply chain to handle things like Maven builds and things of that nature, which are very insecure in nature <laughs> because you can inject from, you know, various other repositories across the internet. Um, so it's very insecure. Our new build chain from, from uh, the OpenSUSE community will be incorporating uh, these different build environments from Maven to Python to Ruby and uh, building something more secure as a, as a supply chain. Um, so we're kicking off an internal meeting about all this next week, in fact. Uh, that we'll be talking about the next generation of Linux enterprise and what that's going to incorporate from a build and supply chain methodology. <clears throat> It'll be very interesting. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. I mean, is there much more you can tell us about the, how the, you know, the security elements of the build service? Just yeah, so out. from the OpenSUSE perspective, the build service, we do use Jenkins in there. Uh, but it does have its own, uh, you know, build environment where it scales out across a Kubernetes cluster and it can build from multiple architectures. Um, so it uses, um, uh, let's see, what's the tool called? Um, I forget the name of it. Um, but it allows for, you know, multiple architecture builds. Uh, no, no matter the, uh, the binary type. Um, it does some very limited stuff with Java today. Um, so we're working on expanding that even more. Uh, that's been a crutch of the environment for many years. But um, uh, it does an extremely good job of connecting to many of the different build sources out there from GitHub to GitLab to, um, and there's many others that it plugs directly in with. Um, it also has, um, some source code checking that I think that, um, in fact, let me pull up some of those pages on how that's actually working today. Maybe I can show you a diagram of our build environment. <laughs> I, I guess one of the sort of interesting things there, Cameron, is from the document, and maybe you, you were able to take a look at it. Is there any items or recommendations that we are missing so far from that, even at a high level, that, that are already implemented in the open build service that you recommend adding? OK. Um, I haven't gone through all the doc yet, but I, I will get there. Um, that's certainly something I can consume this afternoon. And, and uh, give you some feedback on whether or not there's some areas that um, might need some improvement there. Well, def definitely need improvement. I think we'll, we'll continue to work on it. Um, I think yeah. we're starting to get some more meat on the, the bones of that sort of skeleton document. And I know that there's a couple of people offline putting chunks of pages together and reviewing it before they submit. But at least the, the high level um, titles are in there. So if there's anything specifically missing, please do call that out. Yeah. Anyone else on the line got experience using open build service? Another additive on the open build service is that it, it can also 
do container builds. And so once you build your application in the container, the output can directly output it to, uh, to a, a registry, which you can inject into your pipeline to do uh, scanning as well. But the idea behind the open build service is that you do all that scanning before it actually reaches the registry. Right. Um, so you're scanning all your binaries, you're scanning your RPMs to make sure that, uh, uh, make sure the RPMs don't have any outlandish CVEs that uh, have not been applied. Um, and, you know, there's, various checks within that environment to make sure it's completely up to date within the sure. pipeline. How, how does it sort of so, um, scan or evaluate CVs within the uh, open source components that are ingested into that pipeline? Is that... Um... Yeah, so this, the build service pipeline doesn't actually scan for CVEs because we actually have a separate tool that we use that will do the CVE scanning. And then it gives a, it kicks out a report to our developers. Since, since we're in the business of making sure that binaries are um, secure and compliant with CVEs, that's kind of a whole, <laughs> that's part of our business, right? Uh, to make sure that our binaries are secure and make sure that they are, they have the latest security patches applied. And so we're doing a lot of the, indemnification, if you will, on those binaries. So we have a security team that is constantly checking. Um, so we have a tool that plugs directly into our build service that's constantly checking binaries. And then it spits out a report on a daily basis. It, it does it in real time. Um, and so you can look at it and look at the report and it will automatically create um, bug reports for us based on security vulnerabilities that it's scanning against the CVE database. Okay. And then we're taking that list, we're doing checks, um, we're writing new code to fix the to patch, you know, CVEs that are, that come out in real time. Um, so it's a very interesting process from our security team perspective. Um, it's a lot different than say a supply chain from a consumer. Supply chain from a consumer might scan a different database and make sure that, um, you know, they're using, you know, maybe some third party or uh, you know, third party tool that's actually got their own database or they're getting it from the mitre.org or some other, you know, location. Um, so, from a consumer perspective, scanning might be a little bit different, but what we're trying to do as, um, as a delivery company, we're delivering the Linux sources, we're delivering all the binaries that are capable of, you know, being inside of a container and, you know, all the binaries for your programming languages and your build packs, all those kinds of things. Um, we're making sure we're doing all the checks up front to make sure that your build packs are completely um, hardened to the point that they have all the, the right security patches and everything available before you actually start injecting your, your source code into that build pack. Um, there's a lot of different methodologies behind all this and behind the scenes, which I'm sure you've, <laughs> you've all discovered, right? There's, there's a lot of ways to actually do this. Um, and SUSE is trying to make this better for the consumer side um, so that you don't have to um, inject this outlandish supply chain security method um, into your software supply chain um, where you can actually pull down a trusted source for a build pack or you know, your programming language of choice um, and then create um, pair that up with, you know, a build service of sorts that, that has all those binaries ready to go. And then you take your source code and, and, uh, um, put those components together and then you kick out, um, you know, your container or your RPM or whatever it might be, whatever your distribution point is. Um, 
So the whole idea about around the build service is that uh, it's it's a built-in uh, process. You only have to worry about your source code uh, that you're writing within your corporation and you're doing source code uh, scanning at that point where everything underneath should be all taken care of by a company like SUSE or Red Hat or you know, you know, whoever's providing you those binary sources um, uh, in a secure way. Um, Maybe I missed that, it. That's what we're this... really trying to do. That's what we're trying to solve. Um, because the, the biggest concern, you know, we see them all the time. You know, we you posted one up here the other day. Uh, and I was like, yeah, I've been telling these people for years that this is a problem, <laughs> you know. Uh, a supply chain attack, um, you know, either through Ruby or through Python or, um, you know, that can happen so easily um, if we are not, you know, doing our due diligence to secure that, uh, that source and where it's coming from. Um, and so SUSE will be doing a lot of work in that area to, to ensure that we have the best supply chain possible. For our consumers. Sure. sure, I guess I'm just trying to think from the security. I guess the, the main thing is, is, is looking through the different um, different best practices we have to see if we've actually picked up a lot of them because I'm just wondering how, you know, as you're going through that pipeline, are you rebuilding the um, open source libraries that people reference within their source code or are you somehow really building all of the binaries and transitive sort of dependencies or do you somehow validate them in some other way? Yeah, in some other way, yeah. and such. Yeah, so there are some validations get, that go on. Um, so, um, in terms of you know where we get those binaries, um, we've got guys that we have hundreds of developers that are working in many different communities. Um, you know, handling. The relationships between, um, you know, the source code owners, uh, the maintainers, you know, those that are writing that source code. Um, we've got developers that are helping in those communities, and if you can imagine, um, you know, when you take Linux as a whole, you know, you have thousands of binaries. Um, and uh, we have hundreds of developers <laughs> that are connecting uh, between these thousands of maintainers across the world. Um, you know, it's, it's a very heavy feat to be able to, uh, to accomplish. And I know from a SUSE perspective and also our open SUSE community, we have very, we have quite a few members of the community that, that do outreach and we are, uh, that are maintainers of, of source code that gets dropped into our build service. So to the point where they maintain the build environment or the build sources for those projects, um, it's not necessarily coming directly from that community. So they'll work directly with uh, those community maintainers. And so some of those maintainers don't know anything about the build service. It's just our community members, developers that are going out and, and maintaining that relationship and maintaining uh, those build sources. And so they'll typically maintain a subset of, you know, a hundred different projects, some of them, um, where they're just maintaining the build on, on certain projects, making sure that the software builds properly, making sure that the CVEs are updated. Um, and so <clears throat> there's a lot of due diligence that goes on there. It's very interesting. Um, and then from a, you know, a pure checking, you know, standpoint, it's, uh, you know, some of those get checked for specific security, um, where those developers, uh, if it's an enterprise developer and it's a, it's a uh, product that is consumed by the enterprise side, those communities will will actually be checked uh, for security by our security team. Uh, we'll put it through some internal tools at SUSE that does you know, extra security scanning than 
than the OpenSUSE community actually does. Um, so the way that it sits today, that actually happens in tandem. So you'll see a lot of you know, the majority of the OpenSUSE software today is actually the same software as the enterprise today. There are very few pieces that are different. Uh, you can install OpenSUSE uh, 15, 15.2, uh, and it is literally identical to SLES 15 Service Pack 2. There are some very minor differences. Uh, you're probably, and the ones that are going to be different are the ones that actually have licensing software in it. Um, Can I ask Cameron, just yeah. with, with, with that build sort of uh, set up there, I mean, what, do you have the ability to attest um, how the build has been put together or? Um, yeah, yeah, let me, do that? So I can find. Toto slide. Uh, we've got some slide decks there, out here that, uh, that talk about how our build service is put together. Let me see if I can find some of those. Um, maybe it'd be useful to send out links and then we can take a look at them offline and maybe add them to the references section at the bottom there. Absolutely. And I, th and I think some of our build service maintainers have actually put out some videos that talk about it too, that are very interesting to, to go through. Um, you, you, you're not sure if it uses in total or some sort of mechanism like that to provide attestations within the build no, process? I don't, I don't think it yet does use in toto, you know, with in toto being as new as it is. I, or something I, else. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let me find these uh, these presentations that lay this out. Okay, well, well that's I'm looking through that, I guess. One of the things, um, you know, I think reproducible builds make sense. Is, are there any volunteers to take that one on as a, as a section? Or we can add it to the, the, the rest of the ones we just go through as a group. I don't know if anyone's got any specific um, in-depth knowledge of reproducible builds and uh, an interest in the call. Fairly niche, so at the moment, so probably not. And so your your active doc is the one that's in the uh, the Slack, right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And what section are you looking at right now? We're just going through it, but I think we've uh, we've got a number of people that are taking up some of the sections, PKI and such. I've just added it at the moment, just below Software Factory. Maybe it needs to go above Software Factory. This is a placeholder. Um, I also added uh, Mr. Weir's uh, um, PhD thesis to the bottom of the references. Uh, it's actually really detailed, very interesting stuff. Very cool. One thing I'm trying to do, Jonathan, I'm trying to go through some, you know, the recent publications, uh, you know, that cloud security white paper, right? I think there's a lot of stuff there that we can just grab and maybe summarize or go into detail where appropriate. Um, uh, a lot of source material there, as well as that, uh, that spiffy, uh, the spiffy book as well. There's a lot of really good stuff there I think we can draw from. So I'm going to be doing that today and trying to grab all that prior art. And then um, I, I wanted to talk about that D-bomb a little bit more maybe next week. So I got a, I, I reached out to, to Chris Blask from Unisys and, and he wants to talk about, he's been doing a lot of work in, uh, in that area. Uh, so I'm going to try to get some notes from him to see what the current state on, is on that. And then I'll have that info uh, for the meeting next week and maybe try to convince them to join us, uh, to join this team too. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I've spent a good bit of time talking to um, Chris uh, about some of the work uh, there. Um, I, I think it's, it's um, you know, it's certainly in that document, right? And the reality is we need some way of distributing that S bomb. Um, yeah. I think it needs to be decoupled too, right? Because if we just say, okay, blockchain, right? That, that doesn't work for everybody. The channels need to be separate. I think the D-bomb kind of addresses that in a nice decoupled way. Um, so 
I don't think we can get too far down it because there that works just not far far as far as long as I, I'd like it to be to really put in here. But uh, as, I, have, have, what are your thoughts on that? It's open for discussion, right? But but I think yeah. um, it hasn't necessarily been picked up uh, widely uh, in the community. I'd say from what I can see. However, there are um, some pretty significant sort of um, initial deployments there from what I can see, see in, in different industries um, um, that I think are, are interesting. So I, I think even if we sort of identify that as a, uh, a functional issue where we have the S-bombs, how do we securely trans, transport the S-bombs and understand that the source code that you received and the S-bomb material that goes with it you know, the, the S-bomb material is associated with the source code or, or rather the, the binary that you're looking at and how you can securely distribute that. That's a problem. And D-bomb's a, a solution that currently exists that people are, are moving forward with. I guess mm -hmm. back to that earlier conversation of, is that a best practice? Or oh, I don't think it's been really picked up yet. Maybe that's a mm -hmm. gap that there's a really good solution that people are trying to figure out if that's a way of fixing it. Yeah, so yeah, distribution of it is definitely a gap, right? In fact, let's and then change so that we'll talk, yeah. Um, secure distribution of S form. Binary material. Well, it certainly looks promising. Right? Yeah, there's some little So I think on the, the SBOM work, there's a, a lot of good work out there uh, from SPDX and, and um, Cyclone DX and how people are using it. And I think that's pretty well understood. And I think there's still conversations about the appropriate file formats and such and how those tools are going to be used to, to actually create those SBOMs and how we can ingest that. But there does seem to be a gap around how to distribute things mm -hmm. securely. Yeah, so I think best practices right now is going to be just to use, and I'm, I'm pulling some guidance from a from, well, white paper I saw at the NTA, it's reference. It would be just to use exist, existing secure channels and develop internal standards and policy based around those, right? Yeah, I think that makes sense at the minute. Yeah. I mean, it brings up the other one is, is, is maybe you extend this document a little bit more and you know we've got a high security we've got reasonable security level low i guess yeah but also we need to demark some of this stuff maybe pull it into that second document of yeah this is like draft but this is a suggestion how to fill that gap yeah or even an appendix that, that has some some of those use cases and possible solutions for it get it out of the main document that oh this this would be cool if this happened but right does it really belong in the white paper well what we're gonna give high level guidance executives on probably not yet. Right. Maybe return the white paper into a book. <laughs> well, that's the, <laughs> that's almost the fear, right? <laughs> is, it, is that what's happening already, Jonathan? Well, we're at a uh, somewhat fairly uh, fairly complicated, right? Yeah, We've got to start well, to tie this up rather than disappear forever. Oh yeah, let's produce the raw content, then we see how we slice it up. Might be a yeah. series of publications, might be one big one, might be a internal living document online. Right. And and that's why I, th I think for, for the for the stuff where we're getting into the you know the gaps and the you know, the areas where we're starting to build new, new functionality or identifying issues. That's the bit that maybe we end up pulling out into that second document, and then we can solidify the best practices and publish that whilst we highlight that these are some gaps and we're going to continue on separately to figure out how to fix that as a community and tutorial of ideas. Right? Otherwise, we'll never finish. Never. <laughs>
Yeah, with, with that, I, I started adding boxes of how far we'll go into each, each section, and what we'll put there. I think we can agree beforehand, like what the scope of each section is, so we don't end up over rotating and putting more than, than we envisioned. I think it's a great idea. Otherwise, we'll just disappear into the rabbit hole and we'll never come back. Right? Yeah, and we'll we'll remove those after the fact. It gives us a placeholder for the metadata for the meta discussions of the sections. One chunk I, I think we're we're pretty light on is kind of the back end of the supply chain and how we distribute the software. Um, we just don't have a lot of content. We've, we've basically got a huge amount of ingesting and validating um, uh, dependencies and the source code. Uh, Git commits and such. We've got a um, chunk of material coming in uh, around the software factory um, and how we can validate the, the rest of the route of trust, etc. But bearing in mind that most um, most of this, you're going to be a producer and a consumer in some way or another. Yeah. We do so need we to get a bit more on the back end. Yeah. So we have to talk about like internal repositories versus external repositories, right? And that that trust and i think we should also add like a difference between a commercial software or a difference between a standalone software or a library because they have different contexts like if a company is building an open source software inside a company right so the sbom and dbom scenario is a bit different from a, a sbom uh, receiving for a commercial software or a code solution uh, from a vendor, right? So, and maybe for a standalone software also, like even if it is an open source software, like a, as a Docker image or something like that. But I think there is a slightly different scenario for uh, SBOM and DBOM in those cases, like especially if a, you know, if, a, if it is a software development company consuming open source libraries and building it internally, you know, uh, I don't know how the DBOM can be aligned the same scenario as a, a company just buying a software from a vendor and they, they may want to, you know, they may get the SBOM from the vendor itself, right? But for open source software, we can't expect all the open source libraries to have SBOM. So, uh, so we may have to generate SBOM inside our build, uh, sorry, inside our software factory instead of expecting SBOM from upstream libraries, right? So. Doesn't that jump back to rebuilding the thing from source and creating the SBOM? Yeah, I mean, that is also related, right? A rebuilding, yeah, so, but even without rebuilding a software, we can still generate SBOM, right? Like in Java, like uh, even if you are just building your application, you can still generate an SBOM of your transitive dependencies without rebuilding them. But ideally, we should rebuild and uh, then we can have more accurate information of all the transitive dependencies. But... Did we not mention it? Uh, did we not have that in there about whether or not you do or don't uh, rebuild? Not a question. Do you, want, do you want to maybe add that in there at the front? Uh, that's what I want to ask. Should we categorize the different types of supply chain software like uh, in a supply chain uh, it can be a, a small library to a full full-fledged software which is just running on a server or a container right like a, it, it may have different behavior of how securely you can procure those like uh, it may not have all the same attributes or requirements like yeah. or it, we just need to say in a i don't know Maybe inside when we mention DBOM, uh, maybe we can say that DBOM in a you know the court scenario, you know, you can expect the uh, you know the DBOM data to be shared with partners and things like that, whatever the channels you have. But for an you know open source library perspective, it might be a different scenario, right? Like uh, something like that. I, I don't know if you need to categorize in the all in the bigger picture in the supply chain. Uh, are we considering only open source supply chain, only standalone software like uh, uh, Linux distribution or something like that? Or uh, are we considering a Java, Google, Guava library or a you know, Go simple libraries and things like that? Do they, 
they may have different treatment we need to provide right like a, and you know we we need to be also practical right like a, we can't expect a, to have as pump for all the open source software libraries like a, at least in in s5 or 10 years i believe but uh, yeah do you want to recommend some capitalizations at the front because i think i think i think it's opinion definitely. on that right? like yeah I, I, no, i'm just asking like it's a, it's a, just a, you know, i just want to ask everyone else thoughts on that like what do you think like i mean there are several common aspect about all these thing but there can be a different things treatment like as i mentioned like it may be specific to d bomb or a specific s bomb generation or things like that any any other thoughts yes yeah, sir I think Vinod, if you maybe make a, a couple of suggestions, you know, go into the document perhaps and just put a, a question or a box as Anders is doing, um, and, and just potentially open that up as a question that we can dig into. Maybe okay. If, if you can supply some thoughts around it, we, we can discuss it a yeah. bit next time. Okay. So what, yeah. What what I was trying to sort of highlight was. In, from the document standpoint, the bit I think we're light on is after the build. And if we're deploying this software, if it's an open source library, how do we get it to you know, open source consumers? If it's, um, if we're providing this guidance to someone who's consuming open source software, and they're obviously they're you know, using our software and they're um, deploying it to other customers, how are we going to actually deploy that? It's a kind of the inverse of how we're ingesting it, making sure that we provide provide S bonds, provide the signatures of the, the work we're providing, possibly send the data that we're uh, we're building into some sort of a, a weak or transparency log. That that's the area I think we're pretty light on. If you look at the document, everything is looking fine up to the point we get. Sorry, I I don't want to cut in, but I I'm I'm not sure I completely understood this are you saying there needs to be more discussion about how to actually distribute any s bomb or other related metadata that's generated or it's more like yeah. the software itself right so we if, if we've and, and you know, that that's kind of one of the answers i guess the future right we've, we've built something but if if the person building this thing is effectively an open source provider you know you, you've got your library what are the recommendations of how you can distribute that thing securely? What's our best practice in how you distribute your open source library or distribute your product? Got it. One okay. thing is please provide in total data in an S bomb. But <laughs> uh, I mean, if if if, we've, if we're talking about package repositories where these libraries are uploaded, I I, I don't mean to get very pluggy of the work we're doing at NYU, but I, I, my, my, my mind would automatically go towards stuff, you know, the update framework for if, if you're uploading these libraries into a repository and then that repository should distribute to consumers using something like tough. So that, that's the direction I'm into right away. So, so yeah, from a consumer point of view, I say I work at an organization, uh, we deploy software in our gap environment. So someone somehow handed me an artifact or I got it from somewhere and pass it to someone else in my team who's going to do the deploy. What would be the guidance on, well, yeah, this, this has a tough or notary signature. Like how does the person go around validating the provenance? Uh, so we put a lot of focus on maintainers of software. What are the best practices, but for the end consumer, how, if, if this landed up in like an artifactory or some catalog, how can they validate what's that process? And I, I think we're doing a great job up front, but how can people really tell if they're just gonna like go pull something that they do that extra step, somewhat hygienic to validate where this came from? How did they check? If it was the simplest checking MD5 checksum or like doing something else, but like what is that at the station they can perform? I think, John, that's where you're trying to get at? 
Yeah, but it's it's. I still see that as the front part. So if if we are a cons, I mean, if it's difficult, right? If we're writing this document and we are the consumer, and this is advice to the consumer, okay, I'm going to build my product. So I've got to validate my inputs. I've got to validate my dependencies, and everything you just said. And there's this, hey, I, I don't know where this thing came from. And it, someone just gave me, uh, you know, some random software in the middle of our factory. And this is advice on how you validate that, etc. What I'm now getting to the point is literally at the bottom of our document. You know, if as a as a consumer of this document, I need to send my code to somewhere else and publish it. What recommendations are we giving that person and how to do that securely? So that consumers further up the supply chain have a, a fighting chance of validating our software. So the way I look at it is this would be you're in the middle of a supply chain, you're not necessarily right at the end. So what are the checks the end user performs? What are the what are the checks the end user performs and how can we facilitate that by providing them that data? So the you know, it could be. We're going to build our product. We're going to contribute an S bomb. We're going to make sure that we sign our relevant artifacts and we distribute it securely into a package manager, for example. It's almost the, the back end. Because the way I look at it is the supply chain, unless you're at the end of the supply chain, the start of the supply chain, you're both a consumer and a producer of software. And this is the, we've done a lot of consumption. Now we look at the production and give it to someone else. And that's the bit to me at the bottom of our document, we don't actually have a lot there yet. And the likelihood is it's the inverse of what we've done at the ingestion point. Does that make sense? Up Back to me, what, what, I'm curious what his thoughts are there. I hate to put you on the spot, but like following up on, well, what, what's that latter part in, in your mind from your perspective? So yeah, this thing has, has tough. Uh, how does someone like verify or, or validate? If you're passing it to like a colleague of yours and yes, this, this was built using Toto, like the artifact has a binary signature. How do they verify that binary sig signature? Should they accomplish that using technology? Should they do that manually? So, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was, I was just, I wasn't sure if you directed that at me. Uh, yeah, you had earlier thoughts on it. So I'm right. It I, I'm actually, I, I actually started thinking some more. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not the most experienced person when it comes to tough. I kind of joined quite a bit later, and I'm more involved on the Dota side of things, but. Uh, I was, I actually wanted to kind of think about this a bit more uh, about how to accomplish this for, for the intermediate steps in the software supply chain rather than just at the end. Because when we talk about tough, I think we usually talk about distributing software right at the end of the software supply chain, right? So, and I, I guess the question is, uh, how do you verify if, if you're an intermediary, how do you verify what was handed to you from the previous step in the software supply chain, right, Jonathan? I, I'm actually looking at the other one where you're about to send it to someone else. Okay. You know, what technologies do you ensure that you've implemented and you distribute so the person next in the chain is able to validate that stuff? And it kind of, we've already hit a couple of them, right? It's generate the S-bomb, right. sign it. I think Jonathan is getting end to end because in the paper we need to cover everything. It would be a disservice if, if we do all these great things up front. But if, like, a malicious actor said, Hey, take this software, it has a B bomb and it's signed with tough. Like, I, I yeah. actually think this is kind of, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I cut someone off. Oh, go, go for it. I'll, I want to hear what you have to say. I actually kind of think that this is where in total comes into the picture because if you perform something and you're about to hand it off, you would also be generating an internal link for whatever you perform, for whatever you did in that particular step. And while we've focused on verification workflows for once we have all the steps performed, we usually have like, you know, one root layer for the entire supply chain and all the link metadata for uh, corresponding to each step in the supply chain. I'm actually wondering about 
some kind of, uh, you know, not a full scale verification, but at the very least you can check that the link for uh, that the, the, the person who's performing a step and has just handed something, right? They can check if the link metadata associated with that was at the very least signed by the authorized person for the previous step and so on and so forth. I, I also wonder if we could kind of capture these transitions between two steps into their own, you know, little root uh, in total layouts to ensure that the right person handed off software to the next step and so on and so forth. You know, I know, you know, when I'm bringing artifacts into an air gap deployment, right, the, the, you know, we get the Docker container, the Docker image at the end of the build process, then I do a Docker export write down the hash manually, burn that on, burn the, the image onto a CD and then walk into the secured facility and, and give it to somebody else. And then they, they verify those hashes match, you know, physically, right? That, that's the current process that is like, that exists right now um, for secured air gapped environments. Um, there may be some other, you know, places that have automated that, but I, I just don't, know if there's anything else out there that that really we can guarantee the security of verifying those hashes there's no build transparency server out there in the internet that we can go query yet right the, the dbomb stuff isn't there so i think that's that's the best way to do it now if we're talking about actually moving the artifacts around right and we have a lot of repositories for that we have artifactory you can set up your own satellite server if you're doing different types of artifacts so we can talk about that um, but as far as distributing like the S-bombs and that attestation information, I just don't think there's a way. Other than manually moving it. Is, it, is that what you're trying to get at, Jonathan? Yeah. Yeah. But it's on the backside, right? And at least we, at least we can maybe provide the contract of, okay, there's no way of shipping this stuff right now, but the best practice would be at least to create the thing. And even if it's available at an endpoint and someone can write the thing down, yeah, this is what you should do, right? And then if you want to automate that business practice, you, you're up, it's up to you to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Mike, what do you think? Oh, uh, me? Um, I'm mostly just listening in still, uh, trying, uh, whoops, uh, trying to uh, get up to speed because it's been a few years. <laughs> since I've, I've uh, sort of operated in sort of the supply chain side. That's cool. Well, feel free to chime in. I think we need to cover all perspectives. Now, Absolutely. like, Cole, I still think about, like, SolariGate or whichever, like, you want to go buy mm -hmm. it. Like, if, if you do an MD5 checksum on the final artifact and you tell people who are deploying this thing, this is what you're going to validate, you're still spreading the thing around, right? So if you yeah. put that onto the CD, that's not, and say, hey, like, just check that we find, like, we did build this thing ourselves. And like, here's the supply chain, uh, the supply chain log for this thing. You're not mitigating that attack. Oh, right. That was a horrible process, Andres, right? I built that on my own machine, not even a secured build server. Um, so, right, there, there's, there, I think, you know, there, there's ways that I want to automate that process and make that better, of course, but that's a process we had. Yeah. Uh, yeah. some history maybe, there, right? Maybe, <laughs> maybe the, the, the conclusion of the white paper is like gracing those questions, right? And questioning everything, how we do things today and the need for something yeah. better. But, but, I, but I think maybe that's it. It's like, like that, that is the, you know, you, if, if we take this from the, you're a link in this chain, okay. Oh. We've clearly got a gap here, but this is the contract that, or at least the end point. You've got your piece of software, and this is your contract to the next down the chain. There's a gap. We don't know how to get that there. It might be, it might be Cole taking your software, writing it on a, a, a CD disk, and, and, and writing the MD5 in the top. But <laughs> yeah, do that. Do an S bomb. You know, take the in total data and at least make it available somehow. Yeah, right. I think yeah, right that in Toto makes that whole process secure that I just talked about. That's the part that I didn't have two years ago yeah. when I was doing that process. Today, yeah. right, I would say, okay, let's let's implement in Toto for this. So at least I know when we're we are making that handoff that we can verify the signatures and the artifacts along the way. So if someone developer does need to develop on their their, their terminal, they, they can use that. 
I think we could point them to these projects to, to fill these gaps in the current work in progress, right? And say that, hey, this is exists here, but, but it, there's no commercial or supported tooling to do any of this. Right. Yeah. To identify those gaps, right? I think there's an added dimension of, yes, like there, you're, you're almost making the assumption that the machines that build that software are properly secured, but it's almost like separated a concern entirely, right? Like there must have been defense in depth and least privilege to this machine. That machine must have been hardened. The kernel must have been protected. The machine must have properly been attested. Memory should have been encrypted. And we often don't like, we just presume like people are doing those things, but like we should state like, hey, these are all the other things that are not supply chain directly, but you should have strong uh, security of all your nodes and all the software that, that executes there. And, and that, that to me is like the, the, the software factory itself, right? And that, you know, if, if I'm building that thing, I'm going to have all of that. I'm going to have, you know, strong, strong protection within that pipeline um, uh, to the nth degree to make sure I know what's being built. Um, and they've got solutions to, to monitor the build stuff every way, right? Yeah. And we have That's a lot of me. great, we have a lot of great reference material. So I'm going to be plugging that in today from the, from the work that Andres and his team did over at the Spiffy Spire book, as well as a cloud native security white paper. I think that, that really, that is a great body of work that we can just plug in. Totally, totally, and and then that's and that's if anything the, the, the bit we've we've got huge amounts of great work in already, yeah. and then it's really cool, and then you send that thing to someone else, and at the moment it's back down to coal with a uh, CD and a piece of paper, mm -hmm. <laughs> but at least we can stipulate the sort of the, the next jump in the chain. Right? Yeah, but it's doing all these things in conjunction, right? Because if if you're doing just one of them, it's not enough. Yeah, you know, in, in, it's okay that there's gaps, right? We all know there's gaps. So this will, if anything, help, you know, a call to action within, within our community to say, hey, let's, let's work on these things or let's work together on these things. I'm going to add basically a, a comment on that section right at the bottom to say, you know, effectively there's the gap of transmission, but do everything above this and at least you give people a chance. Yeah, Mike, you, you've gone off mute a few times. Oh. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say, because I think to what you had mentioned before, um, I know in the past, one of the big things for us was, you know, everything you mentioned about, you know, securing the build servers, I think is huge. And I think one of the things that, that has been sort of, I think the big open questions is how do you guarantee that what, you know, let's say an open source um, build is doing, like, how, how do you guarantee that they are following that protocol you've outlined? Yeah, so I'm going back even from build to source, right? Like uh, there can be NPM or PyPay package, like jQuery package or something, which may even have a backdoor inside that. I mean, even it is a secure build uh, they are following that can still execute, right? So my point is that I think um, at least in the software factory for uh, some threshold security, I think we should rebuild everything from source, which we can't trust. And uh, we should generate our own, um, uh, you know, S-bombs and uh, in total testation, whatever we need, right? So we shouldn't just trust it because it's an open source. It has a in total testation, it has an S-bomb. You know, attackers can still publish a library like in, a, you know, <laughs> with all these things, they know that uh, we just need to have a in total, or we just need to have an S-bomb at this uh, software bill of material, yeah, right? right? So that's, that's what I'm thinking, like maybe uh, we may need some kind of a threshold for a, like a higher security requirement. Uh, yeah, so this library should be rebuilt in the software factory and re-attested or something. I, I mean, whatever other internal security like static analysis or dynamic analysis they want to do, they can do all this testing and they can have their own threshold and they can certify that it is internally certified and it is internally side inside that company to use for further as a supply chain ingredient for other software, right? You know, you, you make a great point and, and we should try to capture that in writing and convey that. Now for that uh, library vulnerability to be exploited, 
you must have like had your network penetrated or someone like exfiltrated a credential and gained access to one node on the edge and like started performing lateral moves. So I think, yeah, we shouldn't like skimp on, well, move away from embedded credentials and like long lived keys and like move on to like identity based systems and have short lived credentials, have MTLS end to end. Like these are imperatives because yes, like there's, there's going to be day zeros, right? And there's going to be like software still written by humans, but we should like automate, like we should delegate to the machine enforcing least privilege at every single layer of the stack. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there can be like this kind of advice for, I mean, we should at some point in future, in my opinion, every open source software maintainer should generate an SPOM from his library. He should do proper attestation. He should uh, securely, uh, you know, authenticate, you know, he shouldn't use weak authentication and things like that. Like, I mean, that's something we can expect in future. And we can also give advice in the white paper for this uh, open source community. But for the consumers, like uh, if they have a higher level of security requirement, I think th that's what I'm thinking. Like maybe, you know, we shouldn't trust anything, right? Like we, we definitely need to go back to the source and see what it is and then rebuild and uh, then sign and attest. But I think, I think we, we covered that part or at least picked that part out with the kind of that document. And I, th I think the, how we're securing the, the build of that software, I mean, that's the, massive chunk of software factory we've got a shed load of, of detail on we, we, we'd be able to dump in there right hopefully we able to cover that but there's i mean it's, it's basically just how to secure a system right there's jonathan i i gotta drop off uh yeah me too my yeah. holiday i'm on with other things i'm, I'm curious if like we need to get the chair sign off but if we move like the that line for KubeCon EU uh, maintainer track sessions uh, was February 7th, but I might be able to pull something off if we want a KubeCon session maintainer track, 35 minute slot. Uh, and we have like the group like share the progress in the white paper. We might not yeah. have to be finished by then. Okay. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. I, I think this is. Something that should have a wider audience, and by then, if we have uh, had this finished, I think really we can start wrapping it up in, in three or four weeks. I thought, but uh, if a tree falls you know, in the forest, right? So we need to do all this promotion. <laughs> we, we need we need T-shirts. We need like mugs. You know, there's like some sort of baby Yoda. Meme we need a we logo need a with a mascot. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'll get my five-year-old son to draw us a picture. Done. No, I agree. I, I, I think it's good because I, I think it's it's important to get the the, uh, the cons out there. And just, just want to make sure it's nice and tight before we before we publish it. But yeah, makes sense to me. All right. I see Cameron thinking loudly. He's got some ideas. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm everyone. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to drop to. I'm sure I'll have more ideas as I go through and read things <laughs> yeah. absolutely cool you so you doing the software factory piece or digging into that later on today or yeah i'm, I'm digging on the boat? I'm di <laughs> no yeah I'm, I'm digging into that today i'm gonna go find a, a hot cup of coffee and a, a nice place to sit and uh start <laughs> start start, start typing all right good do stuff. you have a mobile hotspot for the boat do you get a reception from the boat um, some places I do, it's pretty good coverage. Um, but I actually just pre-ordered Starlink. Um, so I'm going to, you know, when that comes, maybe next, by next fall, I'll be, you know, camping out and nice. <laughs> for, for a lot, for a week or something and working from the woods. We'll see. We'll see okay. how that works. It's, it's a dream. Maybe, I don't know how, how fall, awesome. Say maybe, again? maybe by next fall, we'll be out of this thing and we'll do the supply chain working group offsite oh, i think we can i hope man. This, is, this has been a drag i'm i'm an introvert but i'm even i'm starting to get it gets stir crazy well, i'm just extremely jealous of the whole boat thing and stalling thing we'll be last in line for that i reckon <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Thanks very much, everyone. I'm going to have to drop. We should think about like the systems of like boats and autonomous boats, you know. (laughs) I like it. All right, right, y'all. I'll talk to you later. Thanks, guys. Thanks.